In retrospect, 2015 was a pretty huge year for me. Not only was it the time I started making videos on YouTube, but I also played a lot of great games last year and even started PC gaming with Steam. So before I move on to 2016, with all the exciting stuff happening then, I thought I'd reminisce about 10 great games that I played last year. Who knows, I might even shine a light on a game that you might want to give a shot. One thing needs to be made clear is that this isn't a list of games that came out in 2015. Rather, these are the games I first played in 2015. Also, to put things into perspective, I don't have a PS4 or an Xbox One. My laptop is only slightly more powerful than a potato, and I'm not rich like all the cool kids who can buy every game at launch. Last but not least, if there was an interesting game that you played last year, feel free to recommend it to me in the comment section below. I'd like to expand my horizon. With all that said, let's get started. Don't Starve is the most recent game that I played after the Steam sale destroyed my wallet, and has subsequently become the most absorbing game that I played in recent memory. Don't Starve is a survival game in the same vein as Minecraft and Terraria, where you go around gathering resources, food, and craft items to survive the randomly generated world that you were dropped into. The game has a starvation mechanic where you have to eat every day to not starve to death, as the title so eloquently made it clear. Gee, if only other games made its mechanics as obvious as it is here. What's really absorbing about Keep Your Sanity Up is while the game relies on RNG, it's still fair and consistent enough with its rules and objectives. By that I mean you're not going to spawn on top of enemies or far away from the most basic resources. The game is very charming, with a pop-up book look of the game to each of the characters' varied designs and personalities. This makes the game very endearing and kept me entertained throughout my attempts to not die. Though if I had an issue with Build a Campfire, it's the fact that death is permanent and when you respawn you start from the very beginning. And the process of restarting after death is very slow. It makes trying again almost a chore, especially when you get really far into the game only to die a horrible death. But regardless, Don't Piss Off the Beefalo was an addicting and overall fun survival game that made surviving in its brutal world enjoyable and immersive. <laughs> You know, the Sunflower once told me that in this cruel world of ours, it's kill or be killed. And you know what? I think it's got a point. Hotline Miami is a psychedelic trip involving gangs, drugs, and the continual loss of your sanity. I tell you more on what the plot is, but I'm not even sure the game even knows. The gameplay is simple. You get some instructions from some random person via your answering machine, you go to a location, select a mask, and go on a rampage, killing everyone that commits the sin of existing in the same building as you during your little episode. Its trial and error gameplay might be a bit frustrating, but it's very satisfying to complete a level after dying a thousand times prior, especially when aiming for a better score. And thanks to the different masks with little bonuses and weapons being swapped out randomly, it makes replaying the levels a ton of fun. It's a small pick up and play game that I had a bloody good time with. Rogue Legacy. Or as I call it, RNG Jesus, this game is addicting. Rogue Legacy is a pseudo tribute to the Castlevania franchise and a modern equivalent to roguelikes with its randomly generated levels. The story is about a random hero of a clan of heroes going into an evil castle to kill the five major bosses and die over and over and over again along the way. Have I made it clear that this game is hard? Because it kinda is. What makes this game so addicting is that every playthrough of the castle will be different. You might find, I don't know, a room with enemies trapped in boxes with a spiked ceiling, a room with large, high-level enemies found later in the game in the first area for some reason, a circus that allows you to play a knife-throwing minigame, or hell, you might play as a knight with irritable bowel syndrome. It's ridiculous. This leads to each and every respawn feeling fresh, despite going through the same areas multiple times. And between respawns, you do unlock new classes, weapons, armor, runes, etc. So there's always a feeling of progress, no matter how hard the challenge might get. Though if I had an issue with the game, it's that while the level structure changes, the music will remain the same. This became so obnoxious that I actually found myself muting the game and switching it out for Castlevania music when I re-entered the castle. It's an overall brutal game that I might never actually finish, but I know I'll have a lot of fun along the way. So after years of hearing that Portal was the greatest first-person game ever, I finally gave it a shot, and... It's good. 
I just prefer Portal 2 to be honest. Portal is about a random test subject waking up to do some tests with a gun that fires portals to solve some very clever physics-based puzzles. You do all this to be rewarded with cake, which, after jumping over toxic water, dodging electrical hazards, and avoiding turrets, I see nothing wrong with being rewarded with a single slice of cake. Oh, and the monotone AI getting noticeably more aggressive as the tests go on? Pfft. That's something to get worried about, right? <laughs> With its clever puzzles and great sense of humor throughout the game, I can easily see why this became one of the best games of all time for so many people. As for that bit earlier about liking Portal 2 more, well, I do agree with the general consensus that Portal 2 has its low points, however I feel that the high points completely outdo anything that's offered in Part 1. Yes, even that ending segment. Not to mention all the jokes I can make about the white shell. Oh, and one last thing, Valve, I know that people are gonna be waiting till the second coming for Half-Life, but can we get a Portal 3, please? I mean, come on, there's only so many hats he can put into TF2. Has anyone else noticed Sony's soft spot for artistic games? They approved of Ico and Shadow of the Colossus on the PS2, and continued this trend with Flow, Flower, and their PS3 magnum opus, Journey. Journey has a bipedal thing, going on a large journey to the top of a mountain. And that's it in terms of plot. Yeah, there's some backstory as to why the desert you're traveling through became a wasteland in the first place, but other than that, the rest is your journey to the top of that mountain. And what a gorgeous journey it is. It's a very emotional, er, uh, trip, with some really good moments, and who knows, you might even find a random player along the way. As pretentious as this sounds, this is an experience as much as it is a game, and all I can say is to give it a shot and enjoy your journey to the top of that mountain. Unless paying $15 for a two-hour game is a massive turnoff, which I don't blame you. Seriously, Sony, what the f- What if I were to tell you that there was a severely underrated platformer on the PS3 whose quality rivals, if not eclipses, anything made by Goodfeel? The Puppeteer is without a doubt the most creative 2D platformer that I've played in quite a while. The plot is about a young boy named Kataro who gets kidnapped by the Moonbear King, and after losing his head and getting the most powerful pair of scissors on the moon, you go on an epic journey to take down the Moonbear King and his 12 generals based on the Chinese Zodiac, while meeting a fun cast of characters along the way. The plot is really good, with some really quirky writing and a very entertaining narrator to carry the characters through the plot. And a tone that rivals Banjo-Kazooie in terms of getting away with stuff in an E-rated game. They say you can't appreciate happiness without a little tragedy. If you want out of this hellhole, face it, you're just gonna have to go to heaven. But the main reason to play this game is the creative levels implementing the scissors to move throughout said levels, and a multiple head mechanic to find the secrets hidden throughout. My personal favorite going out to the Halloween-themed levels. It's so creative, and there's so much variety within each part. There's a lot of heart put into this game, from the quirky writing, the various unlockable backstories, to the bobblehead collection item description. Seriously, there was a chance no one would read this, and yet they wrote something entertaining for those who would. It's an overall great 2D platformer that any PS3 owner shouldn't go without playing, and is one of the more underrated games on this list. In 2014, I played through the Ace Attorney trilogy and found a great series of games that I was seriously missing out on. Following that was the polarizing, but still good, Apollo Justice and the amazing Dual Destinies. Apollo Justice takes place seven years after Trials and Tribulations, where you play as a new protagonist, Apollo Justice, and for reasons unknown, Phoenix Wright has lost his attorney's badge. On top of defending your group of wacky, colorful, and annoying defendants, you have to find out what happened in that seven-year gap. And while I have my overall annoyances with most of the game, I never wanted to stop playing, unlike some of the worst parts of the original trilogy. Dual Destinies takes place after Apollo Justice and involves the returning Phoenix Wright, Apollo Justice, and the new attorney, Athena Sykes, going up against five cases involving the changes in the law over the years Phoenix was gone. The stakes get higher, the cases get crazier, and it still has the creative spark that made Ace Attorney great. Both games have great characters, funny writing, spelling errors, amazing music, and a great plot that kept me hooked until the end credits. Of the two games I played, I had to say I much prefer Dual Destinies, but regardless, if you haven't played this amazing series of games, then you are really missing out on an overall great series. To answer the immediate question, wherever that is, I'm that.
Anyway, Splatoon is a new IP from Nintendo, being a 4v4 shooter, with the goal to capture as much territory as possible by coloring it in your own ink, and swimming through said ink by turning into a squid. To accomplish this goal, you use a huge variety of weapons, from a super soaker that shoots paint to a giant paint roller, a sniper rifle, a gun that shoots explosive bubbles, a bucket, and the freaking minigun taken straight from TF2. Turf War is a ton of fun as it feels more beginner friendly and allows player to get good at the game before getting into ranked mode. Ranked mode is where the training wheels are taken off as you go into three types of tougher and more rewarding types of matches. Splat Zone, which requires you to cover a small square with ink for 100 seconds, which is easier said than done. Rainmaker is like Capture the Flag if the flag had the power to shoot tornadoes and is a ton of fun. And Tower Control is where you escort a tower from point A to B while not dying and it's... Okay, I guess. There's also a single player mode that's, uh, meh. I really like the structure of the game, where it unlocks more weapons and modes similar to a single player game. The mechanic where you turn into a squid makes the game more fast paced, especially since both the reload and sprint button have effectively been combined into one move. Also, just from a game design aspect, I like its way of keeping players coming back with the clothing shops that change daily and Splatfest that fuel a growing metagame. The soundtrack is great, especially the music that plays in Splatfest. It's upbeat and energetic, which is a perfect fit for this game. And thanks to its constant updates, adding more stuff, I can definitely say that until Splatoon 2 comes out, this game will continue to stay fresh. You know what they say, peer pressure is the perfect way to influence people. Similar to 2014, I was pelted with overly positive recommendations for an indie game. In 2014, it was Shovel Knight, and in 2015, it was Undertale, and I am really glad to have played it. Undertale is about a young kid falling into an underground society filled with monsters, as he goes on a journey befriending, or slaughtering, his way back home. Along the way, you'll meet a colorful cast of characters and read some of the funniest dialogue to be put into a video game. Aside from its great writing, the unique selling point with Undertale is that the battles take elements from RPGs like Shin Megami Tensei and bullet hell shooters like the Toho games. The enemies act like puzzle bosses, since you can avoid killing all of them by doing specific actions in battle, and you can dodge attacks during the enemy's turn. Your choices on killing or befriending the enemies and bosses will lead to three possible endings. The soundtrack is incredible, especially those boss themes, as they build up your excitement, set the mood, or just add character to these characters. I honestly can't see why people wouldn't want to give this game a shot, unless you just want to have a bad time. Talk about a pleasant surprise. If you're wondering where Undertale got the idea to talk to enemies as a gameplay mechanic, look no further than Shin Megami Tensei. The fourth entry in the main series was a game that I thought would be an interesting little game from a franchise I don't really hear much about outside of Persona. What I ended up getting was a deep RPG with a dark and disturbing plot that was strong with its ambiguity. A plot that's so insane that it goes out of its way to trick the player into thinking that they're playing a completely different type of RPG for the first quarter of the game, only to pull back the curtain to show a huge conflict and your role in said conflict. I'm not going to give a plot summary because the plot is best experienced with minimal spoilers. That and the real meat of the game is in the gameplay. The turn-based combat is one of the best forms that I've seen in an RPG with its insane depth of combat. This involves exploiting enemy weaknesses to get more moves thanks to the press turn battle system, as well as using buffs and debuffs to turn the tide of battle. And thanks to its fast attack animations, it makes random encounters less annoying and grinding kind of fun. There's a demon negotiation system where you can talk to enemies, mostly to join your team, and it is also an endless source of ridiculous dialogue that's always fun to read. The next huge part is Demon Fusion, where you can fuse two or more demons together to make a more powerful one. Not only is this useful to make a party of more powerful demons, the creatures themselves have a lot of varied designs and are all visually interesting to look at. The soundtrack is amazing. Catchy battle themes, atmospheric overworld music, and music and cutscenes that set the mood perfectly with the shifts in tone throughout the story. If I had one problem with the game, it's that the plot has some severe pacing issues where some parts feel way too long, and its difficulty might be a turnoff to most people, but these issues never really hindered my overall enjoyment of the game itself. I'm gonna end it with this. Throughout 2015, I blabbed about this game several times, and I still have more things to say about it. If that doesn't show how much of an impact this game had on me, I don't know what else will. This is the Renegade Master, and I'm excited to get into more games in the Shin Megami Tensei series, like the Devil Survivor games, and Shin Megami Tensei 4 Final when it comes out. And let's hope that 2016 is an even greater year for gaming. With all that said, I'm signing out.